Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody out here. Just kidding. If the government's watching, nobody's here. We're maintaining our six feet. Kind of. Kind of. So, again, since we're streaming, we can take a little bit of liberty, and I would put it up on the screen and show you what Deb's doing, but if you're streaming and you're on Facebook, I would encourage you to share the live stream on your, on your wall, right? Start a, um, a watch party. They're just little buttons right there. That's all you got to do, and then you can invite people to church all that does is we're not looking for numbers. We're not looking for look how many times people have viewed it. We're looking to get God's word out there. So if you're watching online right now, I'm giving you that couple seconds here, share it. Tag a friend, you know, that, that needs Jesus. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ability to get your word out. Lord, we thank you for the freedom in this country to have your word go out on the radio, to have it be streamed on the internet, to, to be able to publicly display it on, on Facebook and on YouTube and all of the other different types of media. Lord, so many are using things like this for, for evil. Lord, but we pray that we would take your word and we would just saturate it out there, that people would hear who you are, how much you love them, Lord, and they would come to know you. Be honored and glorified. Be blessed as we worship you, as we celebrate who you are, God, and as we study your word. Open our eyes and our ears, and mostly, Lord, our hearts to receive what you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. By the cross you came and broke them down, you broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and in my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life, back to life. And hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love without death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. But a love without death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love without death can hold us down. 
we shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. See your love. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, that your, your love does wake us up, Lord. Wakes us up to eternal life with you. And oh, what a glorious God you are. We thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes. Help us to hear your voice today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, a few quick announcements, and we actually have some announcements to make here. But uh, next Sunday, or this coming Sunday, I should say, uh, we're going to celebrate communion as we normally do. And uh, this uh, time it works out towards an evening service. And so we're going to gather here at 6 o'clock, and uh, we're going to go through our, our communion service, and we're going to hope that you'll kind of uh, play along and sing along with us at home. And to facilitate that, uh, we went out and we got these um, kind of uh, uh, self-contained communion <clears throat> element units. It's got the juice in it, and then the lid. It's got the, uh, uh, the wafer and stuff. And uh, it's our plan uh, to distribute these to the church. I mean, I guess you could use your own grape juice and your own uh, crackers at home, and, and that'd be fine. Uh, but uh, I, I'm also looking forward to as a kind of a point of contact to being able to just touch faces with people and maybe deliver these through the week uh, to those that want them. And so um, uh, I'll be contacting you to uh, see in the future uh, just about every this week. And so uh, looking forward to having community together, uh, even if we're separated uh, over the Internet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it'll be a great time together, and so uh, that'll be uh, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, April 5th at 6 o'clock here live, and so looking forward to that. And then, um, uh, you know, we're so dependent right now on the internet uh, to get our services out on Facebook and uh, the streaming, and even the radio station is, is to some degree is uh, dependent on the internet. And so uh, if something happens to Facebook or something happens to the streaming, uh, the KWLK 88.5 on your radio FM dial is the next best bet, uh, and that would be the last leg possibly to go down if it all went down. Uh, and if it all goes down, uh, and there's no internet, there's no radio, there's no anything, uh, just know that we'll be here at church on the appointed times doing the regular services. Uh, I'm not going to tell you all to come, but I will say the, the doors will be unlocked, and, um, and uh, let your conscience be your guide, uh, <laughs> kind of a scenario. Uh, but, uh, and then if it all goes down like that too, uh, I'll be here at church uh, through the week, and if any of you need prayer or need to come by or you're, you're scared or you just need toilet paper or whatever's going on, uh, we'll be here. And so uh, you can come by and visit with us if you so choose. A along those lines, I, again, I, was, uh, I mentioned this uh, Wednesday night, and I want to make mention of it now, uh, about some of the coronavirus stats. And there's a couple of ways of looking at these numbers, you know, because you can almost in a certain sense make numbers say anything. But uh, the population of the United States right now is 331,483,530 people, give or take. Uh, the number of current cases confirmed as of 6 o'clock yesterday, Saturday evening, was 121,578 people had the coronavirus. And, and it's a big number only because we're the only country that's aggressively testing everybody, and, uh, and, and we've got more testing going on than any other country on the planet. And so it's kind of jacking our numbers up a little bit. But even still... If you take that uh, 121,578 cases that we know of and divide it by the 331,500,000 uh, you know, uh, people, that gives you a percentage rate of 0.0367% of people that actually have the coronavirus. But what I would point out, that means that 99.96% of the people don't have it, <laughs> okay? Don't, no one ever pushes that number. They go, oh, no, what's the number? And, and, and it's just really kind of small number with a bunch of zeros in front of it. But I'm just going to tell you that right now, as of today, 99.6 people in America do not have the virus. And, and so that, to me, that's pretty good. Of the 121,578 known cases, uh, sadly, 202,026 uh, 2 people have uh, passed away as of yesterday. 
which is a 1.67% of those who actually got it pass away. But out of the total population, that's only 0.00061%. Okay, so it, it's, it's like 99 point, I don't know, 7% or something like that uh, are unaffected. And, and so I wouldn't let that bother you. Uh, you know, I want to give you a couple of scripture references, and if you, if you download the, the, the bulletin for today uh, on the PDF that's on our website, uh, I put some scripture references on there, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You know, the, the, the God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, so, and, and there's a bunch of other scriptures that are listed there that I just encourage you to look up and, and take a look at. Also, I want to ask you to keep praying for uh, those very few victims of the coronavirus that are out there. Uh, but still, it's a serious thing, so I want to pray for them. Uh, pray also for the, the needed repairs to our radio station. Uh, we've ordered the parts, and, and they're on the way. Uh, ju we're just praying that they get here quicker. Uh, pray for our first responders, the medical personnel. Uh, pray for, our, our, for wisdom for our national, state, and local leaders. Um, and pray for peace and calm in our community. You know, I mean, would the world really fall apart if we lost the Internet? I mean, uh, you know, because you can still, like, you know, scrambling your eggs on the stove and all that kind of stuff. And so I think we're going to be okay. Uh, you know, um, I'd ask you to pray for, uh, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm making these, these prayer requests because it's in lieu of all the other things we would normally be doing. But uh, pray for a guy named Troy who's been going through a hard time and, and that the Lord has speak to his heart. Uh, pray for Burl Reed, uh, who's got some lung issues. Uh, he's uh, uh, Sheriff Pohl's uh, son. Uh, pray for Veronica. Uh, she just had her baby not that long ago, a couple months ago, and, and she's got a fever and, and, and dealing with some stuff. Pray for baby Asa. Uh, you know, uh, he's got a fever, not feeling well. And I'm sure there's others. Uh, but, you know, be in prayer. You've got extra time, so, uh, you know, take advantage of that. Uh, pray for uh, Ethan and Katie Bevan. Uh, she's close to delivery, and, uh, and just pray for a healthy, safe delivery. Uh, pray for Zach and Elise uh, Parker, uh, uh, just for a healthy pregnancy and all those things. And so, uh, there's lots of prayer needs, and if you want a, a better list, then give me a call or, or, or text me or email me, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some clues. But um, Father God, we thank you for the opportunity even to be here today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Guide us, Lord. Help us to worship you in a way that pleases you. Help us, Lord, to proclaim your word and to receive your word, Lord, uh, and that we take away everything you've got for us today. Be glorified in this place, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. No 
Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. And all you hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires ever have been granted in what he ordained? goodness and mercy you daily attend me. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend me. Praise to the Lord, O let His people again, glad before all we adore Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again, glad before all we adore Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All you here, now to His temple draw near, praise Him in glad adoration. We sing your praises in glad adoration. I pray that those that are going through the valley, Lord, that are going through trials, that are going through a storm right now, Lord, 
that they would lift up their voice and they would praise you in the midst of everything. Lord, we know that you are in control. It's not only at the mountaintops, the high places, Lord, when everything's going well, that we should praise you. Lord, it's at all times. Teach us, Lord, that in those storms, Lord, teach us to be quiet, to listen for your voice. Lord, to listen to you speak. Teach us to wait, Lord, for you to move. I forget who you are and who you have been. A mighty God, perfect in. Remind me, Lord. Remind me, Lord, lest I forget who you are. this morning.
will choose life. I will choose life, even in darkness. Your truth lights a beautiful spark in this heart and soul. And be still and know that my fear's gone here in your presence. some that are that are struggling right now that are in fear they don't know what's going to happen next Lord we know that your word tells us not to live in fear not to doubt so I pray right now that you would come against those fears in Jesus name that you would build a hedge of protection around your saints Lord, around your believers, your followers. Lord, and that you would pour out your spirit. You would renew their strength. Lord, pour yourself into them. Sing Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come renew. All of my strength, Holy Spirit, come renew all of my strength. Let's pray that together as a church. Holy Spirit, come renew all of my strength. Holy Father, loving Father, Lord, awesome God, we worship you this morning and we acknowledge, Father, that you're the only one that can strengthen us. You're the only one that can carry us, Lord. You're the only one that can sustain us. 
We thank you for your faithfulness to do just that. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the Holy One of Israel, Lord, and the Holy One of our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hey, uh, I, 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 we usually say hello, greet everybody, that kind of stuff, but uh, just real quick, I want to pray for the kids that are listening and the kids that are in the, in the households. Um, Father God, we lift up uh, all the children uh, that are home with their parents, uh, all the children that perhaps will be uh, uh, watching and listening. Uh, Lord, I pray that they'd be able to focus, uh, to sit still, Lord, to allow their parents to, to receive your word, that they would receive your word, and that truly, Father God, you'd be glorified. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapters 17 and 18 as we continue in our trek through the Bible. And um, before we get to the actual reading of it, I just want to remind you that we did post uh, a map uh, that correlates with the, this morning's study on our website, and I pulled it up on my, uh, my uh, iPhone this morning, and you could blow it up and kind of look at it. And, and so uh, I, the map's going to be behind me as we get into the study, and I know it shows up a little bit bright on everyone's uh, screen at home. Uh, I tried to find one with kind of a uh, little bit darker, richer colors to kind of mitigate that a little bit. Uh, we also are experimenting with a, another new scheme uh, for the uh, PowerPoint, uh, so the, uh, the references hopefully show up uh, better than before as well. And so uh, I'd, I'd uh, welcome your feedback on that, uh, but don't text me during the study, <laughs> please. Um, and then uh, we'll get back to uh, all that. But anyway, uh, Isaiah chapters uh, 17 and 18, uh, I'd like to read those together and then we'll get into the study. So uh, even if you're at home, I know you're at home, uh, would you stand with us in reverence uh, for God's word as we read it together? Isaiah chapter 17, <clears throat> beginning now at verse 1, it says, uh, The burden against Damascus. Uh, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Uh, the cities of Arar uh, are forsaken. Uh, they, uh, they will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Uh, the fortress also was seized from Ephraim, uh, the kingdom from Damascus, the, the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. In that day it should come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane, and the fatness of his flesh uh, grow lean. It should be as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads with his arm. It should be as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, like the shaking of an olive tree. Uh, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost bow, uh, four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. In that day a man will look to his maker, and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Uh, he will not look to the altars, uh, the work of his hands. Uh, he will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images, nor the incense altars. Uh, in that day... His strong cities will be as uh, a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, uh, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Uh, because you've forgotten the God of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold, therefore you will plant pleasant uh, plants and, and set out foreign seedlings. In the day you will make your plant grow, and in the morning you will make your, your seed to flourish, but the harvest will be a heap of ruins in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of mighty waters, but God will, will rebuke them, and they will flee far away, and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, uh, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And then behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is no more. Uh, this is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Woe to, the land, uh, woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reed on the water, saying, Go, swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible and fearsome uh, from the beginning onward, uh, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide. All inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountains, you will see it. Uh, when, he, when he blows a trumpet, you will hear it. Uh, for so the Lord said to me, 
I will take my rest, and I will look from my dwelling place like a clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he will both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks, and will take away and cut down the branches. He, they will be left together for the mountains. <clears throat> they will be left together for the mountain birds of prey, and for the beasts of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them, and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. In that time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin, and from a people terrible from their beginning onward, uh, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, to Mount Zion. Gracious Father, we read these words, and, and, and as we read them, Lord, we, we, we just come to acknowledge that we need you, Lord, to help us understand them. We need your spirit, Father, to guide us and to lead us, as you promised, Lord, that that, you're, that you would leave us the Spirit. He would not be comfortless. We would not be orphans. And he would teach us all things and remind us of all things that you said. And so we look to you this morning for understanding in these things. Guide us, Lord, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. Well, looking at chapter 17, um, it starts off with uh, the burden against Damascus. And we're going to use um, a map here in a minute. And I know, like I said, it might not show up real good on your screen. I'm hoping it will. Uh, but uh, you can download it at home and, and look it on, on your device or, or you can print it out and, and you can kind of get a better look here. But it says, uh, the burden against Damascus, uh, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. And so when, it's, when it, that phrase, the, the burden against Damascus, it means that the heavy thing uh, that is about to befall them. Uh, Damascus is and, and was the capital of Syria, which is different than the, 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 the empire of Assyria. They're two different, uh, two different uh, er, um, kingdoms, if you will. Uh, the Assyrians eventually do conquer uh, the, the, the land of Syria. And, and Syria pretty much disappeared from history as a nation after that, uh, being conquered by a number of nations and caliphates. Uh, eventually, they were absorbed into the Ottoman Empire uh, of um, um, and then after World War I, uh, that same land eventually became Syria uh, as a modern nation. Uh, then it was given over uh, to the French mandate. And it's kind of interesting, wherever the French had a mandate, uh, like in Haiti, uh, like in other places, it seems like they were all pretty messed up. But um, anyway, uh, that's a whole other study. But um, after World War I, uh, that same land later became Syria as a modern nation and was given to the French mandate and remained so until after World War II when they became an independent nation. Uh, but for a season back in the day, uh, they were a, a nation to be reckoned with uh, until the Lord brought them low under the Assyrians. Uh, later, and, and it's interesting, I'm going to read you something. Um, it, it's kind of almost like a folklore uh, kind of a thing. And it just describes uh, uh, that Damascus was in their day, in their heyday, if you will, a, a, a glorious city. It was a place that uh, people went to that was like, wow. Uh, going to New York or something like that. But, um, and I read this in a couple of different commentaries, and that's why I'm going to repeat it now, even though I, I say it with a little bit of uh, understanding. It's probably like, uh, uh, I won't say a wives' tale, but uh, certainly tradition. <clears throat> it says, uh, uh, during Muhammad's time, uh, he and his army drew near to the city and looked down on it from a hilltop, and the Arabian false prophet turned to his followers and said, it is given to men to enter but once, but one paradise. We will not go into Damascus. Uh, with that, he and his cohorts turned away. And, and it was kind of Muhammad complimenting Damascus on being such a, a glorious you know, city and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you don't see that today. You don't, see, you don't, you don't get that from you know, looking at uh, modern-day Syria or Damascus. You don't get that really from a lot big parts of history. But it was a big deal. And uh, you know, the prophecies in chapters 15 and 16 that we studied last week, uh, they were uh, written in uh, 704 B.C., and the prophecies that we're reading this morning uh, were written about 30 years prior to that. And, and, and in other words, the, the prophecies aren't always in exact chronological order as we go through. And it, it, in this morning's study, as we get through it, you're going to see it's a fascinating study because so much of it applies to the prophecies that are almost upon us right now and the fulfillment of it. And so it's going to be 
Uh, for me, it was really an eye-opener to, to, to study this through. But Damascus is one of, if not the oldest, continuously inhabited city on the planet. And, and so this is a prophecy that is yet to take place, uh, describing its complete and utter destruction. It's been conquered, uh, but not destroyed. It's been conquered uh, many times, actually, but not disinhabited, as it's describing here in our passage. And prophecy watchers and, and uh, uh, Bible students are all over the map on this particular prophecy that it could happen basically at any time. We're not sure if it's going to happen before the rapture or after the rapture, or we're not sure if it's going to happen before the Magog invasion or after the Magog invasion. Uh, and so in a certain sense, it really could happen any time. Uh, we're waiting to see. It's one of those kind of distinct prophecies that feels like or seems like it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, you know, and it could just happen. And, uh, and so, you know, we're waiting to see. I've always kind of assumed uh, that this prophecy was kind of an individual mandate or judgment, that it, but it could be part of a bigger uh, prophetic fulfillment. And, and I say that because of uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 19. Here John records for us, now the great city was divided into three parts. That's speaking of Jerusalem. And the cities of the nations fell. And, and, and that's a very generic, you know, could be a lot of cities, including Damascus. Um, and great Babylon was reminded before God, or remembered before God, to give her uh, the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so uh, it could be part of a broader fulfillment. Anyway, uh, looking at verse 2, the cities of Ararar are forsaken. Uh, they will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them afraid. And so last week we looked at an Ararar that's uh, uh, in the in the uh, midst of Moab uh, and near the uh, the Salt Sea. Uh, and then this is a different Ararar uh, that's actually just south of Damascus. And so there were a couple different cities that were had the same basic name. And so um, uh, Ararar, uh, th this city or cities, uh, will be so thoroughly destroyed, uh, the people will all have been carried away captive. And that, that word forsaken means no one's left. And, and they will only be inhabited by sheep and cattle, basically, as they graze. Now, when it says there, the cities of Arar, uh, typically in that area, in that region, they would have what's called a mother city. And Arar was a mother city. And then around that, they'd have smaller children cities, okay, just like uh, Jerusalem was a mother city. Then there were other smaller cities around that, and Hebron and other cities like that, Samaria and so forth. And so when it says the cities of Ararar, it means the mother city, the main hub, and then all the suburbs, if you will, it's smaller cities around that. The region would be another way to put that, uh, is going to be thoroughly uh, destroyed. And so, um, you know, a lot of devastation there. Then in verse 3, the fortress also was seized from Ephraim, uh, the kingdom of, from Damascus and, and the remnant of Syria. Uh, they will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I, I kind of forgot to point out a minute ago, and just looking at the map for a minute, uh, Damascus is up here uh, in, by the big word Aram there, but Damascus is, is the uh, capital of Syria in the day. But you can see over here this, this bigger area. This is all the extent of the Assyrian Empire. And so the Assyrians came in, and they, they conquered the, the northern kingdom of uh, uh, Israel. Remember, the, the kingdom was divided. And so Ephraim is another common name or reference for uh, the northern kingdom. And so um, Assyria, Damascus, and Ephraim are linked together. Uh, as you recall, the, the kingdom of Israel uh, under David, under Solomon, was a, a united kingdom. Uh, but after the death of Solomon, uh, under his son, uh, Rehoboam, uh, basically the kingdom was divided. And so you had Jeroboam, the king of the north, you had Rehoboam, the king of the south, and, uh, and it was kind of sad to see it break up like that. But eventually what happens is uh, um, the, the northern kingdom, or Ephraim, uh, they uh, form an alliance with Syria, and the, the two nations, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, the kingdom of Syria, uh, form an alliance against Judah. <laughs> of all things. So you've got Jews fighting against Jews aligned with, uh, you know, these, uh, these pagans and stuff. And so it, because they, they allied themselves with uh, the Syrians, uh, the northern kingdom and the Syrians, uh, their fate is kind of tied together. And so you see that uh, through this passage this morning. And so um, um, 
and, and, and the, the Ephraimites essentially share in their judgment. Now, from this point forward, uh, and, and verse 3 is actually pretty key to understanding the rest of the chapter, because as you go through this, you're going to wonder, well, who's he talking about? And Because uh, you could apply some of this to the Assyrians, you could apply some of this uh, to the Syrians themselves, you could apply some of this to other people, but from verse 3, this transition, the rest of the chapter is actually talking about the northern kingdom. It's talking about the Hebrews and how they're going to be judged. Uh, in verse 4, it says, And that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane, and the fatness of his flesh will grow lean. Uh, it shall be when, as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads uh, with his arm, it shall be he who gathers, as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, uh, like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost bow, uh, four or five in the midst, or uh, in, uh, in its most fruitful branches, uh, says the Lord God of Israel. And so speaking really of the, the thoroughness of the destruction, uh, Jacob's going to go from being, as it says there, uh, the fatness of his flesh is going to grow lean. He's going to go from being chubby and prosperous to being skinny and poor. Uh, you, you look at verse 5, it says, when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads in his arms, uh, there used to be a saying uh, when I was a kid that was used a lot, that you're, you're like grass and I'm the lawnmower. And, uh, and that's kind of what God is saying. You're just like a, 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 a bushy yard, and uh, I'm the lawnmower that's going to come through and clean you up. And, uh, and, and so it's kind of a, I'm paraphrasing a little bit of some of you know. But um, anyway, um, but it's going to be, uh, 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 when, when a field is harvested, they do their best not to leave anything behind, just enough to glean. And uh, the reference there to the Valley of Rephaim, uh, the Valley of Rephaim extends from Jerusalem to the southwest from Jerusalem. And it's a very fertile area. It's where they did a lot of their agriculture and farming and stuff. And so uh, he's talking about, hey, you know, the way the grain grows, the way the wheat grows, and the barley and all that stuff, uh, we're going to come through and just mow it all down. Uh, the inference here is that there's going to be very few people left uh, when they're done because the, the, the Assyrians basically are going to take them all captive and take them away and displace them out of uh, their land. Uh, verse 6, uh, Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, uh, like the shaking of an olive tree, uh, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost bow, uh, four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. There's a, a short-term and a long-term fulfillment of this prophecy, as there are so many that we're reading. The short term is that in that day, there will be very few people left, just a, a small remnant. Uh, the long term is that another remnant described in the New Testament uh, will be preserved from which uh, a, a, another group will be saved, if you will. Uh, Paul relates to this in, in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, when he says, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. Now, understand, he also said in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, uh, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. In other words, um, it, it, it's in the true remnant that God recognizes the true seed of Jacob. Uh, those who turn to the Lord will be preserved in that last time of trouble uh, during the great tribulation time period, uh, as they were in the past, and God will take care of them. Uh, in verse 7, In that day a man will look to his maker, and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Uh, this is one of those verses uh, of a couple more coming up that points to the fact that we're talking about the Israelites uh, because uh, uh, um, the Assyrians, uh, the Syrians themselves, I keep saying the same thing twice, but uh, the Syrians and the Assyrians, uh, they don't know the, the, the true and living God. And, and so this is referring back to uh, the Hebrews. And so in that day, <clears throat> again, uh, short term, Still speaking of the Israelites, uh, a man will look to his maker, and it kind of makes you wonder what it will take for us in our day. Uh, but in, in Micah chapter 7, verse 7, therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And so it's the encouragement, obviously, to pray. Uh, but the long-term fulfillment uh, will take place after the abomination of desolation. Uh, we read in Zechariah uh, chapter 12, verse 10, and it will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and will grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. 
And so there's going to be the, the short-term fulfillment of this, that they're going to recognize that they need to get right with God. And then there's going to be the long-term fulfillment, where they're basically going to recognize the fact that they missed the boat, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, and they're going to see him again, and they're going to weep, and they're going to wail. Uh, in verse 8, uh, he will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. Uh, he will not respect what his fingers have made, uh, nor the wooden images, uh, for the, or, uh, nor the incense altars. And so they're basically going to repent and turn away from uh, their false gods. Uh, they're going to repent and turn away from uh, their idolatry. It's an interesting uh, historical fact uh, that uh, not so much this time, uh, at this time, but later on when they're conquered by the Babylonians, uh, they're taken into a land, they're captured and, and taken away, and they're brought to a land that is filled with idolatry, a, a place that's filled with the pagan uh, practices that they so abhorred, uh, but engaged in at times as well. And, uh, and it's interesting that uh, after their Babylonian captivity, when they come back, it seems to, uh, to the most part, they're, they're uh, cured of idolatry. Now, they have other sins they got to deal with, <laughs> but uh, idolatry doesn't seem to be the issue in the land of Israel after the, ba uh, the, the return from captivity. And so, uh, interesting how God uh, was able to deal with that. But, you know, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 115, verses 3 through uh, 8, it says, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. And so, he, you know, our God is sovereign. Our God can do anything. Uh, but then he goes on to con contrast that with their gods are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Uh, they have mouths, but they don't speak. Eyes they have, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Noses they have, but they don't smell, even though I think they stink. Uh, they have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Uh, nor do they mutter through their throat. Uh, and so he's describing the fact that the, they're, they're, they're pagan idols. They can't see with their eyes. They can't touch with their hands or move or do anything. They're, they're useless, basically, is what he's describing. Then he says in verse 8, those who make them are like them, meaning they're just as dead, just as innate, if you will. And so is everyone who trusts in them. And so, you know, it's silly to start praying to a rock or a tree or some created thing that God's made like that's your God, but it can't do anything for you. And what he's saying is that there's going to come a point when the Israelites, especially in the northern kingdom, as they're being attacked by the Assyrians and conquered, uh, they're going to realize that their, their pagan gods or idols are of no value, no use. And so they're going to turn back to uh, the true and the living God, which is the right way to go. God is always seeking to draw his people closer to himself. Whether it's they repent and come back to him, or if you're walking in his ways, he wants to draw you closer and closer still. And so I love that about our God. He always wants to receive us. You know, Isaiah spoke the same basic message concerning the nation of Israel previously. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 20, it says, And that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, of which they made each for himself, uh, to the moles and the bats. I love that. Uh, if you've got a God small enough that you can pick it up and chuck it into a, a ditch or a cave or, you know, just get rid of it like throwing it in the trash, then your God is too small. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, essentially, that's what they're going to do. In verses 9 and 10, it says, In that day strong cities will be a, a, as a forsaken bow a, a, and an uppermost branch, uh, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. But Why? Because you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Therefore, you will plant pleasant plants and and set out foreign seedlings. But this is another proof that we're talking to the children of Israel. We're not talking to the Syrians. We're not talking to the uh, people in Damascus, per se. Uh, we're talking to the children of Israel because they're the only ones that have forgotten the God of their salvation. Okay, And so we have kind of a cause and effect relationship here. Uh, forsaking God leads to destruction. And you know, um, there, there's people that say, well, they, don't, they haven't forsaken God. They're just doing other stuff. Well, you can call it forsaken in a lot of different ways, uh, but unless you're living for the true and living God, in a sense, you've forsaken him. And so we've got to be careful uh, not to do that. You know, Paul warns us. He tells us in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, 
but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so we reap what we sow. And, you know, when we sow to the flesh, sadly, we, you know, when we uh, um, harvest that, uh, it's always in an exponential way. You know, you put one, one or two seeds in the ground and you get a tree that bears thousands of seeds, you know, fruit and all that stuff. And so uh, we've got to be careful how we, how we sow because we're going to reap in an exponential way. But he talks here about uh, pleasant plants and, and foreign seedlings. And what they had done was they had planted uh, orchards and vineyards, and it was a very fruitful land. And they later planted a, a number of seedlings from foreign places. They worked hard. They were industrious, uh, but to no avail because somebody else would be eating their fruit. Somebody else would be enjoying the fruit of their labor, if you will. Um, God is referred to here as the, the God of their salvation and the rock of their stronghold, uh, their God. And we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, again, emphasizing who we're talking to. You know, God, our God, the God of the Bible, is the only one who can save them uh, from hell, uh, which would be worse than anything they might experience from the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians were cruel, uh, for sure, and they did horrible, despicable things. Uh, when it talks later on about um, tall and smooth-skinned people, the, the word for smooth skin means peeled, uh, that they were skinned alive. And, and, and just horrible things that the Assyrians did. And, um, and, uh, and, and as, as, as hell-ish as that would be, it doesn't compare to actual Hades or Sheol or the abyss, right, being cast into hell. Uh, people, it's way worse than people know or think. And, it, and it's way worse than anything you can actually experience uh, in this life. And so it's, it's worth avoiding. Uh, but, but, but our God, the God of the Bible, is the only one who can save. You know, been mindful of your stronghold. Uh, you've forgotten the God of your salvation. Again, we've got to be careful not to do that. Uh, later in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah declares in Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there's no Savior. Uh, there's no one that can save us uh, besides the Lord. And, and while he is the God of their salvation, uh, they've turned away from him. They've rejected that salvation. And, and I want to ask you, if you reject salvation, what's left? The only thing that's left if we reject salvation is damnation. It, it, it's, it, it's, being, it's condemnation. And, and so we don't want to reject the God of our salvation because, again, he's the only one uh, that can save us. Uh, we read in Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, verse 6, uh, describing the same group of people. It says, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. And, um, you know, again, bad things follow. Uh, this, and this actually kind of describes the history of the northern kingdom. If you recall, uh, from the moment that they broke away from the southern kingdom, uh, remember they were led by uh, Jeroboam, who was a very poor leader. And I say a poor leader. He was a smart guy, and he was accomplished, all kinds of worldly stuff. He was a poor leader because he led the nation away from the true and the living God. He was a poor leader because he, he initiated and encouraged idolatry. He built a golden calf and said, now this is your God. Worship him. He's the one that delivered you from Egypt, and, which is totally false. But he could be the smartest guy on the planet, but the fact that he led him away from the true and living God makes him a poor leader. And, and from the very moment that the nation was divided, the northern kingdom went off into idolatry. And, and, and they turned, they're turned back from the, the true and the living God. They, they didn't seek or inquire of him. And uh, they, they turned away from the God of their salvation. And look at the heavy price they paid for that. You know, it's, it's a lesson for us to learn. Uh, in verse 11, In the day you will make your plant uh, to grow, uh, and in the morning you will make your seed to flourish. But the harvest will be a heap of ruins in the day of grief and desperate sorrow they're going to be spoiled. I mean, they're going to be pillaged and spoiled. And, and he's describing the judgment upon Ephraim. Uh, he says, your work's going to be for naught. Uh, uh, they, they kept planting and working, but uh, all to no avail because somebody else is going to eat that and enjoy the fruit of it. You know, by the time that the, uh, uh, the Ottoman Turk Empire had conquered what was then known as Palestine, uh, the force of Lebanon and Israel had already long since been cut down. Uh, the trees that once grew on the Mount of Olives and on uh, Mount Scopus, uh, according to Josephus, the historian, uh, had all been cut down by Titus uh, during the siege of Jerusalem. And it's a well-known fact that during the long years of Turkish, uh, Turkish misrule, 
uh, that the land was almost completely denuded of trees. Um, during the last century of Turkish dominion, uh, the Ottoman government basically put a tax on all trees. And so all the inhabitants, many of which were not Jewish, uh, there were a lot of Arabs were there and stuff, but because there was a tax on the trees, they figured, oh, I'm not paying the taxes, so they cut down all the trees. And this is part of a program, by the way, intentionally uh, uh, by the Ottoman Turks uh, to destroy the land of Israel. And so uh, as a result, uh, the place is almost completely eroded away. You know, it's nothing but a bunch of rocks and stuff. Well, after World War I, when the uh, mandate for Palestine was given, uh, uh, for Palestine was given to the British, uh, they began a program of re reforestation all across the arable mountains and, and lands in Israel. And they brought in trees from a, a lot of different places, from Europe and, and stuff like that. And sadly, a bunch of it, most of it burned down in some very uh, you know, massive kind of forest fires. When the Jews took control, uh, they began the same kind of a program, bringing in trees from different places and, and citrus and different things. And, uh, and now, uh, they, in fact, they've gone through cycles of trees where the, the first trees they planted died out because they weren't, uh, they weren't intended for that original kind of climate. And, uh, but they were able to find the right kind of trees. And now you go to Israel, and there's trees all over the place. And, uh, and it's just kind of interesting that trees are mentioned so prominently uh, here in our passage. But uh, looking at verse 12, actually 12 through 14, it says, Woe to the multitude of many people who, who make a noise like the roar of the seas and to the rushing of nations, uh, that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Uh, the nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the, the, the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like the rolling things before a whirlwind. Uh, then behold, at eventide, trouble. And before the morning, he is no more. Uh, this is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. And so this is a, a prophecy that goes way beyond what's happening there. And, and, I, and I'm going to kind of break it down for you a little bit. But he's saying basically that the, the invading army is going to come in mightily, in a sense, but woe to them. Now, the short-term fulfillment of this is with the Assyrians. They, they're going to sweep in and conquer the northern kingdom. Uh, they're going to conquer most of Judah and the southern kingdom. Uh, they're going to take Moab and Arabia. They're going to take Syria and all that kind of stuff. But God is going to rebuke them, okay? And um, God will blow them away like chaff in the wind, uh, like tumbleweeds, you know, uh, in the whirlwind. The long-term fulfillment of this uh, belongs to, I believe, Gog or Magog and, the comp uh, and, and company. Uh, they're going to experience the same devastating defeat at the hand of Almighty God. Look at verse 14 again. It says, before the morning, he is no more. Uh, this, I believe, is yet another reference to the miraculous way that God dealt with the Assyrian uh, invaders and how he will deal with the nation uh, the nations that seek to plunder and rob Israel later on. Now, we've been through this account a couple times, so I'm not going to reread the whole thing to you. But in, in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, you can go back and, and read the whole story. It's actually very, very cool. But as you know, uh, when the Assyrians were coming in, uh, they didn't go directly to uh, Damascus. They actually kind of did an end run along the coast. Uh, they took the northern kingdom, and then eventually they came and took uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, Almost all of Judah. They, they, took, they were laying siege against a larger city called Lachish, and that's where the majority of Sennacherib's army was uh, uh, you know, in battle, if you will. And then he sent a, a contingent uh, to Jerusalem to take that, thinking it wouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, and that map that you looked at earlier, you'll notice that they've got the Assyrian Empire all laid out, but there's like a little circle drawn around Jerusalem because that's the only area that they didn't conquer. <laughs> okay, so there's that little island on the map which to me is pretty cool because the Assyrians never got to do that. And the story behind that is they laid siege to Jerusalem intending to take it. They made all kinds of threats. They sent, you know, they're very insulting to the God of Israel. And um, as Hezekiah took their threats, they were written down and laid them out before the Lord. So God, do you see what they're saying? And uh, as, as, uh, Hezekiah is humbling himself and he's in sackcloth and ashes and he's praying to God. Uh, God responds to the prophet Isaiah, who then comes and informs Hezekiah don't worry, uh, not even an arrow is going to come over the, over the wall. And the next day, we read that an angel of the Lord, and our, it's in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, and it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 
And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Now, that implies a couple things. Number one, the army was bigger than 185,000. I don't know what it was. I'm going to say 300,000 just for kicks. Those other 100,000 people got up and realized that there were 185,000 dead in the midst of them. <laughs> How would you like to wake up, you get up you get, you, and you look over at your bunkmate and he's dead? Or you walk outside and all you see is a sea of bodies and they're dead. That would probably impact your ability to fight. <laughs> you know, that would probably go, we've gone up against the holy city of Jerusalem. We've insulted their God. And then we wake up the next day and almost 200,000 soldiers are dead. The correlation would be, I don't want to mess with that God. <laughs> I don't want to mess with his city or his people. And so basically they pack up and they leave. Now, later on, describing Gog, and that G-O-G, not, not God, but Gog, okay, like Gog and Magog, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 17, thus says the Lord, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? You know, and so... This speaks of, this speaks of a, a, another fulfillment. Now, uh, right there again, uh, this is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. This is what happens when you take the bull by the horns. This is what happens when, you know, you spit on Superman's cape, all that kind of stuff, you know? I mean, the bottom line is that uh, you know, you're, you, they don't know what they're dealing with. Now, the near-term fulfillment of these verses would certainly apply to the Assyrians. You know, in a way, perhaps it could even apply to the Babylonians or the Romans because there's a list that kind of goes on. But the long-term fulfillment of this belongs to the Assyrian. Now, I don't say Assyrians. I say Assyrian, singular, okay? Remember him? This may also apply to Gog uh, and Magog and that confederation from Ezekiel 38 and 39 that comes against Israel. But in, in both these instances, God will show himself strong on their behalf, and they're going to get smoted. You know, that God's going to deal with them in a miraculous way where no one's going to be able to say, oh, it was luck or it was, you know, for, uh, fortuitous circumstances or anything else. It's going to be done in such a way that the world will know that it was God that struck them down. And, and we're going to see that uh, more profoundly, I think, in the next chapter. Remember the end of this uh, chapter, it, it kind of ends with, and this is the lot of those who rob us. You know, uh, Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. What that means to me is that one way or the other, sooner or later, God will take care of business. You know, that we don't have to avenge ourselves. And it also means that God t cares about what happens to his people. You know, in, uh, in Psalm 105, verse 15, we read the psalmist declares, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. That's, that's the word of God, a command of God. You know, in Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God takes all these things very seriously. And, and as I read the last little part of verse 14 here, you know, uh, this is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. I can't help but think of a verse that I've been kind of saying a lot lately, and, and I'm, I hope you're not tired of it, but uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will, bless, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so it's really just the fulfillment of another aspect of God's word that he's going to take care of Israel. You know, he's going to show himself strong on, on their behalf. And because he does that, I believe he'll show himself strong on our behalf as well. That now leads us into uh, chapter 18. It's a pretty short little chapter. And, uh, you know, just by way of a little bit of introduction, uh, again, we're going to use the same map uh, to describe a couple of things that are happening here. But, uh, you know, Assyria has conquered the northern kingdom. They've gone through Moab and conquered Arabia, and they've conquered Egypt. Uh, they were trying to take Judah and Jerusalem, uh, but God stopped them. We just talked about that with the, the slaying of the 185,000. They were actually camped out on Mount Scopus. And, and so it's so close uh, and around the city there. But uh, here, chapter 18 uh, is now addressing the Ethiopians. And, and we're going to talk about the Ethiopians and the Egyptians. And then in chapter 19, we're going to get on specifically to uh, the Egyptians. 
But uh, this morning we're talking pretty much about the Ethiopians. And, and it's based in part on their reaction to how God deals with the Assyrians and their siege of Jerusalem. Now, a, a couple things. Um, chapter 18, uh, I was so glad to read this. I, I, read, I read and reread chapter 18, and I'm studying it through, but I'm getting confused about who the players are and, and what's actually happening to who. And so uh, eventually, you know, I looked at a couple commentaries, and there's some commentators think that chapter 18 is talking about the United States. Uh, a couple of English commentators thought they were talking about the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and so there's actually uh, some confusion about this chapter. And one commentator kind of quipped, and I, I wrote it down because it really spoke to me, that this small chapter is the most difficult chapter of the 66 chapters in this book to understand. And, and so it's a challenging uh, exercise to go through, but I think we're going to make sense of it as we work our way through this. Now, uh, verse 1, it says, Woe to the land uh, shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And so the idea of buzzing wings refers to uh, the area of Ethiopia, which is or was actually part uh, uh, the southern part of Egypt. Uh, and uh, again, I'm going to use uh, this map for a minute. Uh, you can see over here on the left, here's Egypt. And you can see it's kind of shaded in as the, uh, the Assyrians came in and they conquered it. But down below here, uh, this is just, and I'm just a very proximate line, uh, the upper part, uh, and actually it's referred to as a, the, the lower part from the Egyptian perspective, that was Egypt proper. And then down in this area and south was, what was uh, ancient Ethiopia. And so, uh, you know, they were divided up. But it, it describes them, and then it also says, that, that, see the, the Nile River? And two or three times in our passage as we read through this, the, the land which the river divides, okay? And you can see that the, the, the Nile River is pretty much in the middle of the country and divides the country, okay? So that's a very common description, if you will, uh, for Egypt. But it's a place full of flies and mosquitoes. Oh, I want to go there. You know, <laughs> bugs as big as your head, you know? <laughs> hey, I tell you what, if the bugs are so thick and dense or so big that they can cast a shadow on the ground, you don't want to go there, okay? And uh, I don't. Now tell me how it is. But um, anyway, so just talk about a place that's full of flies and mosquitoes. Uh, in um, Zephaniah uh, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, uh, You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. And so, you know, God is singling out uh, all these different countries that had come against uh, Israel, come against Judah, and one by one, they're being dealt with. And this chapter will deal with, in part, uh, what's going on with Ethiopia, then uh, next week when we get into chapter 19, uh, we'll be talking about what's going on with uh, Egypt proper and all that. But uh, in verse 2 it says, uh, which sends ambassadors by sea, speaking of the you know, Ethiopians, uh, in, in vessels of reed on the water saying, go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin. Now, the Ethiopians uh, use the river, the river Nile, uh, here referred to as the sea, to send their ambassadors and everything else, basically, to Egypt. Uh, their vessels were made of reeds. Uh, maybe you saw that old movie, Kentiki, uh, a long time ago, kind of described that. Uh, but they're made from be uh, reeds and bulrushes. They're, they weren't really seaworthy, like going out on the Mediterranean, uh, but they were great for coastal areas and for uh, the River Nile and that kind of stuff. But it describes them as a fearsome people, uh, the people terrible or, or fearsome in their beginning forward. But it also goes, if you go back a little bit, uh, to a nation... Uh, tall and smooth of skin. And um, uh, the Egyptians uh, shaved most of their body hair off. Uh, they were smooth of skin. I'm not sure how tall they were. Uh, but uh, maybe the Ethiopians were tall and smooth. I don't, I don't really know. But that, that phrase, a nation tall and smooth of skin, that's the New King James. In the King James, it says, a nation scattered and peeled. Now, this is kind of a little more ominous because... Uh, it's describing a nation that was defeated, conquered, uh, scattered, and skinned. Uh, it could refer to something less, like you know, naked and exposed. Uh, but when you when you look at that word, it literally means, in a sense, skinned, as in skinned alive. And this is consistent uh, with what uh, the Assyrians did on a on a frequent basis. They they did horrible things. I won't get into all of it, um, but it's all, all all pretty bad stuff. And so. At one time, the king of Egypt attempted to make an alliance with Judah, 
against the imminent attack of the Assyrians. And they had to be bolstered in that, knowing that the Assyrians were, were not able to take Jerusalem. <laughs> and so it's like, whoa, they got something going on over there. You know, maybe they can help us. Uh, remember, the, the, the Moabites did the same thing, and uh, to no avail. And so, uh, but uh, Isaiah counseled against that. Uh, uh, he saw it was a bad move, and so he counseled against it. But then it describes that as whose land is divided by the rivers. Uh, again, we see ancient Ethiopia, uh, the southern part of Egypt, if you will, divided by the Nile River that goes up to the middle of it. Uh, in verses uh, 3, and, uh, 4, and 5, it says, All inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountains, you see it. And when he blows a trumpet, you hear it. Uh, for so the Lord said to me, I will take my rest, and I will look from my dwelling place like clear heat in sunshine, uh, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Uh, for before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he will uh, both cut off the sprigs with the pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. And so, referring to God's destruction, eventually, of the Assyrians, uh, but look at verse 3. It says, um, all inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner, and when a banner, I see banner, I think about a sign, okay, uh, on the mountains, you see it. And so basically, he's talking about a sign for the whole world, all the dwellers on the earth. Now, when uh, God smote the 185,000 that were laying siege to Jerusalem, that was a big deal. It's obviously a miracle. But did the whole world see that? Did every nation? No, I don't think so. I, I think it was a localized enough thing. Maybe they may have gotten around and heard about it, but you know, if there were Eskimos in Alaska or if there was you know, uh, people down in South America, I don't know that they heard about that. Um, but he's describing basically a, a, a total defeat there and something the whole world's going to see. Now in verse 4, he says, For the Lord said to me, I will take my rest and I will look for my dwelling place. And you know, uh, the Lord will take his rest and will look from his dwelling place. That could be heaven, certainly, okay? Or it could be a reference to his resting place, which was the temple in Jerusalem, right? If you recall uh, the history of all that, the temple in Jerusalem was the highest place. It was the, the t tallest building, the best, if you will, vantage point to see what was going to happen, certainly outside the city. I mean, from that vantage point, uh, there in Jerusalem, uh, he had a clear view uh, to see the destruction of the 185,000. And then in verse 5, it goes on uh, that it would take place before the summer, uh, before the harvest, before the grapes are ripe. And so God would cut down the Assyrians like, a, like, a prune, like pruning a bush or like mowing a yard. But according to verse 3, this, would be, this is to be a message to the whole world, to all the dwellers on the earth. And so there's going to be more to this. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation as, a dry, as dry as the wilderness. And so <clears throat> the capital of Assyria would eventually be destroyed. But was that a message to the whole world? I don't know. I don't think so. But let's go on because I think it's going, to, it's going to fill in the gaps here. In verse 6, it says, they will be left together uh, for the mountain birds of prey uh, and for the beasts of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them and, and the beasts of the earth will winter on them. And so uh, the birds and the animals are going to feast on the dead bodies of the invaders from summer through winter. Now, not only are there a lot of carcasses out there, you know, in the field, so to speak, but they're laying out in the open field. They're not buried. Okay, that's why the animals have access to them. Now, I don't think this is the 185,000 that were killed by that angel. Okay? The reason I'm doubting this is because I doubt that the Jews would leave all those bodies all around Jerusalem waiting for the animals to do the cleanup work. Okay? That's not kosher. So, uh, this could be the result of another epic battle, one that the whole world would see in some way, shape, or form. And fast forward, in fact, if you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 39. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 39. I'm going to read a portion of it. I'm going to read a couple parts of it to you. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 39, 
uh, verse 4, it says, You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops, and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Okay, that's the, the prelude to what we're about to read. Uh, look at uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 39, uh, beginning at verse 11. It says, And it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by, uh, pass by east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers because there they will bury, there they will bury Gog and all his multitude. Uh, therefore, they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying, and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men regularly employed uh, with help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land when anyone uh, sees a man's bone, uh, they will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Ham and Gog. The name of the city also will be Hamona, uh, thus they shall cleanse the land. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird, to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal, on the mountains of Israel. You may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and lambs, of goats and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat till you are full and drink till you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. You should be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, with all the men, uh, with all the men of war, says the Lord God. And so I think that this is, again, a dual application. There's the part that you can see from the temple, what's going on around there. And then there's the part uh, that God perhaps could see from heaven, the whole thing. But also, uh, there's a part that they could see locally, then let down the road that everybody would see because of our fabulous internet and uh, telecommunication system and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, I see, it, again, uh, this dual application. Now flip back to, uh, uh, flip back to Isaiah chapter 18 and take a gander at uh, verse 7. <clears throat> it says, In that time, uh, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts, okay, from a people tall and smooth of skin, and from a people terrible or fearsome, okay, from their beginning onward, uh, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide. Who's that? That's Egypt, okay, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, to the Mount Zion. And so in that time, the people of Ethiopia will send a gift to Judah, to Jerusalem, a token of thanks and appreciation because of the God of Jerusalem had destroyed their enemy and their nemesis, namely uh, the Assyrians. Uh, that witness referred to in verse 3 was effective because there were worshipers of the true and living God in Ethiopia after that. Uh, we read in, in Zephaniah uh, chapter 3, verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, get that? My worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. And so, you know, in the last couple of weeks, as we've gone through uh, uh, the previous chapters in Isaiah, one of the, the, the things that we've seen that's been just striking is the heart of the prophet and basically the heart of God for his people, that, that God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here we see in the midst of this judgment, there are those who would come to know the Lord then, and I believe futuristically, and even now. And so, it, it, to me, it's strange to read this, this seemingly, this chapter about judgment and about the, the, the things that are going to take place, and to know that it's actually evangelistic in nature, because God is going to save a remnant, God's going to save a people group out of the midst of all this, the Ethiopians actually come and, and, and are referred to by the prophet Isaiah as, quote, my worshipers. And so, you know, I, I obviously, if you're listening to the study right now, uh, you know, for the most part, I believe that everybody is saved. You know, we, we, we've all made that commitment to the Lord. We've received him as Lord and Savior. And we're learning about what we've 
kind of gotten involved in by studying through the Bible. I've met people before, you've probably met people like this, that say, well, you know, when, when these bad times come, when the tribulation comes or the rapture happens, well, then I'll get serious or then I'll get saved. And, and there is that possibility that people can, that can happen. But in the midst of the tri tribulation, in, in the midst of judgment, there are people that are looking around figuring out, you know what, these guys are, are, are being uh, ch chastened, if you will, uh, because they, they'd forgotten the God of their salvation, because they had not been mindful of the rock, you know, uh, of their stronghold. And, and they looked at that and go, hey, that's a smart way to go, you know, or you can just kind of get thumped and beat up and smoted, and, and, and that's not necessarily the smart way to go. There are scriptures in the Bible that say that uh, those that have heard the gospel and rejected it and don't get raptured and survive, if you will, into the Great Tribulation time period, that their minds will be deceived and darkened. You can read about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And, uh, and so there's a possibility that people that say, well, I'll do this later on, they may never have that chance. You know, because if you can't accept Jesus Christ now, as he's reaching out to you, as the Holy Spirit's coming alongside you, if you can't do that with the help of the Holy Spirit now, what makes you think you're going to be able to do it later on, uh, you know, when those things aren't as prevalent? And so today is the day of your salvation. If you're sitting here thinking, oh, no, the coronavirus and it's the end of the world and all that kind of stuff, and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then you're a fool. Because, it's, you know, if all that's crashing down around your ears, you need to do something about it. And you can't change the coronavirus and you can't change everything that's going on around you, but you know what? You can change your heart. You can choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. You can have the promises that the Bible gives us that if we trust, if we, if we believe in him in our heart and confess him with our lips, you shall be saved. You can have that. Your, your eternity can be secure. Or you can sit around and wonder what's going to happen. I am kind of curious about what's going around, on around us today. I'm curious in the, in the sense of how does this fit into Bible prophecy, and I see it fitting in in all kinds of ways. But I'm not at all curious about what eternity is going to be. Because my eternity is secure because I've accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'm cool. Whatever happens and plays out in front of me, I'm going to heaven. My wife, my kids, my friends, my family, we're, we're, we're all going to heaven. And we want you to come with us. And the only way that's going to happen is if you come to God on his terms. If you receive him as your Lord and Savior and say, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. And who has a problem with that? I mean, we're all sinners. It's so obvious and plain. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I, I've offended you. Would you... Forgive me for my sin. I believe that you died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I believe, God, that you rose again. And, and I believe, Lord, that, that, that you alone are God and worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And, and would you come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. And Lord, receive me in, into your embrace, into heaven forever. If you pray that prayer, he will receive you. If you believe it in your heart, he'll receive you. Then you don't have to worry about what's going on with all this other stuff. And then as you read your Bibles, you read through Isaiah uh, 17 and 18, and you see these things being fulfilled. You go, wow, that's really cool. Glad I'm not going to be here to watch it, but it's really cool. And so I just want to encourage you today, receive the Lord, and don't be left in the lurch. God bless you. Father God, thank you so much for uh, your word. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us. Lord, thank you for the, 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 the promises that you make to us and the many, many, many ways that you prove yourself to be true. Help us to be yielded to you, Lord, and help us to to, to, look, to look up, because our redemption draws nigh. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, let's uh, continue to worship.
Jesus, oh Jesus, crucified, raised to life, Jesus, lift him high, lift him high, Jesus, crucified, raised to life, Jesus, we lift him high, lift him high, oh. Oh 
Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for speaking to our hearts today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes, Lord, and helping us to see that you're there, Lord, you're there, and you're watching over us even now. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to, to, to have confidence in you, Lord, that our faith would be strong, Lord, that we wouldn't be fearful, Lord, that we'd be faithful. So guide us, Lord, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. Pray you have a great day today. Continue just to read through your Bible. You know, continue just to spend time in prayer, praying for all the different needs that are out there. And we look forward to being reunited with you soon. God bless you guys. And, and like I said, if uh, uh, the, the radio and the internet all conk out, we're going to be here doing the studies anyway. And so... Um, um, the doors will be unlocked. God bless you.